I'm uh, Walid Alskaf, co-founder of uh, Rebalance Earth. And today I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have Ian Redman, uh, co-founder of Rebalance Earth, um, to talk to us about forest elephants becoming and recognized, I should say, as their own species. So Ian, uh, could you please give us a quick introduction on yourself? Yes, uh, I, I'm, I, I describe myself as a, a naturalist by birth, a biologist by training, and a conservationist by necessity. And interestingly, my first job when graduating as a biologist, um, if you can call it a job, was going to work as Diane Foss's research assistant um, studying mountain gorillas. And sadly, the last of the resident elephants that often used to hang around the research center uh, at 10,000 feet in the forest, uh, in the Virunga volcanoes uh, on the Rwanda side of the border, uh, the study area was shared between Rwanda and what was then Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I arrived there just after the last of the resident elephants had been killed by ivory poachers. So occasionally, groups of elephants would come over the border from the, the Congo and, and pass through our study area. And those were very exciting days. And they were forest elephants, but they were montane forest elephants living high up in the mountain forests. Uh, so they, those were the elephants that I first saw in the wild, and it was thrilling to see them. And the differences between forest elephants and savanna elephants, which are more often filmed because they're out in the open, easier to see and to film, uh, are, are considerable. And, and scientists have been tussling for, for decades. Are there subspecies or separate species? And in the Virunga area, north of the mountains in the Virunga National Park, is a hybridization zone where you see a herd of elephants with some with forest elephant characteristics and some with savanna elephants. And some people were of the opinion that that meant that they couldn't be separate species. They must just be subspecies because they can interbreed. Um, but indeed, we know many full species that can, given the opportunity, interbreed and produce a hybrid. So that wasn't really an argument, but it's what held things up. <laughs> and scientists studied the, the morphology, the shape of the elephants, the behavior, their ecology, and, and then as, as genetic studies improved, it was realized, particularly with a paper that was published in 2010 in Nature, that absolutely separate species, a, a forest elephant in Africa is as different from a savanna elephant as the difference between the Asian elephant and the extinct mammoth. And no one's going to be saying, well, they're the same right, species. Right. We had. No, they're, they're distinct species. And yet, despite that sort of landmark paper in 2010, the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, elephant, African Elephant Specialist Group, still didn't take the jump and say, yes, we recognize there are two species until just now. The real, um, real world difference that that makes is that if you count all the elephants in Africa, even though there are fewer than half a million, as compared with probably 10 million a century ago, or a century and a half ago, we don't know exactly because no one was counting then, but we've lost more than 95% of Africa's elephants. Even so, the, the criteria that they use to decide whether a species is vulnerable to extinction or endangered uh, or critically endangered, um, the continental population only met the vulnerable category. So that's, it's, it's a mm -hmm. cause for concern, but not as worrying and, and, and not as not triggering as concerted a, a level of action to protect them as if they were endangered or critically. Now, you take that continental population and divide it into two, and it turns out that the forest elephants have had a catastrophic decline over the past three, three decades, on top of an earlier decline. But, but even just in the last three decades, the, the review revealed that our best available information says they've seen an 86% decline in 31 years. But by far and away, the biggest driver of elephant decline is the illegal ivory trade. The international commercial trade mm. in ivory has mm. been banned since 1989. But some uh, tiny minority... Exactly. So how come it's still happening? Well, uh, because the, some of the traditional markets, parts of the world where people really value ivory, uh, and it is a beautiful substance when carved, they want to continue to buy it. They think it will always have value. Sometimes we think it's it's actually just investors buying it as a 
hedge against inflation. Whatever happens to currency, if people will always want ivory, then having a, a storeroom full of ivory is, is like gold or, or some other precious substance. But the trouble with ivory is that, well, although technically you could pick up tusks from dead elephants that have died of natural mortality, if the price of ivory is so high as it is, then people aren't going to wait around for elephants to die of old age. They want the money now. So they go out and right. kill elephants. Right. And, and this is a, a practice which has been going on, well, for, for centuries. But the advent of firearms really threw the, the, the advantage in humans' favor when, when up against elephants. Before that, um, courageous hunters with spears would, would get in close and, and try and kill elephants. And it was messy and painful and horrible, but not that many elephants were killed. But the minute you can stand some distance away and send mm. a projectile uh, in the shape of a bullet into an elephant, then more elephants and people die in those encounters. And that's been happening for um, a century and a half. So what does that mean today? Yeah. Today, the illegal ivory trade continues despite the customs officer's best efforts to prevent it. Uh, elephants are being killed across Africa, but especially where law enforcement is weak and especially where it can be done covertly. And whilst you can see a gang of poachers on the savannah because they're out in the open, and you can use aircraft to back up the rangers and radio down, say there's poachers active in this area, send a team in, it's much easier to respond if you have those th th that, that equipment. Um, but in forests, you can fly over it and see nothing. Um, so, Ian, what does this development mean for you? The fact that, you know, finally the IUCN, you know, has, has recognized it as two different species of African forest elephant, that it has put it on this in critically endangered list. You who has been observing these animals for, for decades, what does this mean to you? And what is your hope of what could be next for the forest elephant? Uh, what it means to me is, is it's recognition of failure. Yeah. We have failed to protect this extraordinary species. You know, elephants have brains four times the size of people. Um, they are complex, sentient mammals. They, they can demonstrate self-awareness and, and rational thinking behavior, and yet we've been killing them for their front teeth. So that has to stop. But mm -hmm. more importantly, and, and this is why our, our work together with Rebounds Earth is important, the fact that they're critically endangered just when we've realized how important they are for global climate stability. And people are thinking, what? And how can a few elephants in Africa <laughs> be involved in global climate stability? Uh, a French biologist called Fabio Bazaghi uh, did a study of two forests in the Congo Basin, one where there's a population of forest elephants and one where they were extirpated decades ago. And what he found was where there were elephants measuring the above ground carbon that, that is the, the trees and branches, there were 7% more where there were elephants. What? H how come? Well, <laughs> elephants, when they're feeding, obviously they're, they're eating vegetation and they're breaking down branches and saplings and they're trampling plants. And in the, the, the competition for nutrients in a rainforest, they, they look so lush, but the soils are often very poor, very poor because so many plants are taking up the nutrients. The minute a tree falls, it quickly rots down, and all the other trees are kind of sending roots in to, to get the nutrients. So what elephants are doing as they feed is reducing the competition for the big trees. They can't push over huge trees, but they can push over little trees, and those little trees would be competing with the big trees. And then just as a gardener does, if, if you take out the, the wild flowers from your vegetable patch because you don't want them competing with your vegetables, you put the dead weeds we call them onto our compost heap and when they've rotted down you put those nutrients back so that your vegetables grow bigger that's what elephants are doing i've been talking about elephants as gardeners of the forest for decades um, but that's been seen as a largely academic oh yes they disperse seeds and there's some nutrient recycling going on but actually they are significantly affecting the amount of uptake of carbon into those trees uh, and that has a value today there is a carbon market. People are desperate to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, in particular carbon dioxide. So if we can say preventing the loss of elephants prevents the loss of that 7% bonus that elephants give 
to the trees in the forest, that's worth money. And if we can protect the elephants well enough that instead of declining 86% over 31 years, the next 31 years they're growing. And we know that elephants, if protected, can increase at, at three or four or five or even 6% per annum. Uh, forest elephants slower, I've just said that, so it's probably going to be three or 4%. Gradually they can recolonize those elephant depleted forests and put back the 7% bonus and rebalance earth, we think, will be able to appeal to corporations that have committed to carbon neutral, zero carbon by 2030 or 2040. Well, they're not going to do that in a hurry because their technology is going to take ages to become carbon neutral. So if, they're, if they can't avoid some greenhouse gas emissions, they have to offset those somewhere else. And what better way than protecting elephants, keeping those forests healthy, which provide other ecosystem services, such as rainfall that waters the world and waters our crops and fills our aquifers and powers our hydroelectric schemes. All that is, is to some extent dependent on elephants. And we've just realized it after we've wiped out 90 something percent of them. So we have to turn that around. <laughs> That's what's exciting and optimistic about this. Yes, we recognize there are two species. Uh, we have to protect the savannah elephants as well. They're only endangered. That's Correct. bad enough. Across most of their range, their numbers yes. have, have declined catastrophically. In southern Africa, some populations are still healthy, which is wonderful. But we can't take decisions for the whole continent based on a few fortunate populations that so far have avoided the big organized criminal gangs coming in and, and killing those elephants. Great, great. I love your passion and your deep knowledge of uh, these beautiful uh, species, Ian. Uh, I'm going to thank you very much, you know, for for sharing, you know, your views on on this announcement. And for you, uh, the listeners, if you'd like to find out more about Rebalance Earth, please, you know, feel free to re to visit our website, Rebalance Earth. Um, if you'd like to find out about how your firm can safeguard and protect that magnificent animal, whilst at the same time performing the services that can do the carbon offsetting, please do feel free to reach out to us. And if you'd like to volunteer and support our program, we have a, a program called The Guardians, and we would love to welcome you. But for now, I'm going to wish you all a wonderful rest of your day or evening, and we'll be catching up to you guys later. Thank you. Thank you.